Hi everyone and welcome to the channel. We're back with part three of the Windows XP machine build. Now in part one we uh, basically put the case together and in part two we filled it with hardware. If you haven't seen those videos and you want to check them out links will be down in the description. So here in part three we're going to get Windows XP installed along with all the rest of the software and then we'll check all that lot out see what we make of it. Now when I've got computers on the bench, as in, in, you know, in this case, um, obviously so that I can see them and film them for you guys, uh, the screen I normally use is uh, this NEC Multisync, it's a 1760VM. Uh, and I really like this, it's a cracking little screen, uh, hence why uh, you know, it stays on, uh, on the bench all the time. But because we've got the kind of funky case for the Windows XP machine, I think we're going to have to use something uh, a little bit different for the screen. So instead, we're going to go with this. So as you can see, we've got the Hercules Profit View 920 Pro DVI. Uh, it's a 17 inch uh, TFT LCD screen. So same size as the uh, NEC one, you know, that uh, I normally use. But the rest of the specs, as you can see from the sort of highlights here, uh, you know, so as far as early TFT screens go, they were pretty good you know they were pretty much as, as good as you got and combined with the fact that this thing's built like a tank which I'll show you in a second when we get it out of the box and um, the price of these things um, when they came out it reflected those specs and you know the sort of build of it and uh, yeah uh, so it was one of the sort of better and maybe perhaps well regarded early uh, early LCD so I'll take it out of the box we'll have a quick look around that and then we'll put the software on Right, there it is, uh, on the desk, and when I said this thing was a bit of a beast, uh, I wasn't kidding. You've got this great big bezel around the edge of the screen here, which is plastic, but the rest of the whole back piece, I mean, just listen to this. That's all metal, uh, steel, I think, just a piece of sheet steel, and then the stand, that's all metal as well, a bit of cast aluminium, I think. The whole sort of weight of this adds up, it's... It, it, as I say, it's a bit of a beast. I, I think I've picked CRTs at which were lighter than this thing. And there's no built-in uh, you know, power supply in here. It's still got a separate brick for running it. So it's not like that's adding uh, a load to the weight. But build quality, yeah, absolutely spot on. Uh, if the picture quality on this is as good as the build quality, I'm going to be really happy with it. I mean, I hope it works, mine. I haven't really tried it yet, so fingers crossed and all that. So anyway, I'll get the uh, I'll get the system on the desk, get everything hooked up, and we'll get the software on. Now, in terms of what software exactly, well, we know it's Windows XP, but I'm going early Windows XP to reflect the kind of date of the system that we're recreating. So you can see here we've got a Include Service Pack 2, uh, Windows XP CD. If I can get that to focus in all its lovely holographic glory. So yeah. Let's get that installed. Damn, slot load drives are awesome. Right, so far so good. Uh, obviously we're installing from uh, CD, as we saw there. What's really noticeable on this um, up to this point is if you saw I think three videos it was uh, back now on the channel where we put Windows XP on that little wise um, what was it a Z90 D7 um, you know little um, uh, I forgot the proper name for the damn thing now the little thin client that's it um, where, okay it's a thin client and it's kind of a low power but it's so much more modern than the hardware in here and that was installing Windows off USB. But yet this, with uh, Windows XP off CD on this much older hardware, it's noticeably quicker. Well, it's been not noticeably quicker so far um, just doing the install. But yeah, so far so good. Let's crack on. Don't know if you can uh, see down here if the camera is picking it up, but um, every now and then you might just see the hard disk LED flashing. It's a sort of yellowy orange, which is a really strange colour to have picked for this. I mean, there's no 
yellowy orange sort of colour anywhere on this case um, at all and it, it doesn't even sort of complement the colours around it so yeah I wonder, wonder why maybe that was just the cheapest one or that was what they had lying around when they made these things uh, either way I wouldn't mind replacing that at some point if possible for maybe something that would uh, complement a bit more Hey, even the good old-fashioned red um, LED, you know, hard disk LED activity would uh, look better than that, I think. Hmm, why do we have an error? So this error kept cropping up every time during the uh, file copy portion of the install. Now, don't pay too much attention to what file it says it's got a problem on. Uh, that file seemed to randomly change every time. But nonetheless, never got through the file copy part of the install. We always got this error. So my first instinct was, well, maybe a bit of muck on the disk, gave the disk a clean. Uh, error was still there, so tried a different disk, uh, another, XP, uh, another Windows XP Service Pack 2 disk. Same problem with that. So then I'm thinking... Maybe it's that slot load drive that's got a problem. It wasn't tested, you know, when I bought it. So tried doing the install in a different, uh, in, the, in the other CD drive. Still getting the same problem. So just to be sure for ruling out the optical drives and the media completely, tried installing XP from a USB stick and got exactly the same problem. So then I was thinking, okay, perhaps it's our SSD or our little parallel ATA to serial ATA converter board. So to take those out of the equation, stuck a standard hard disk in and just connected that straight up over parallel ATA, you know, straight to the IDE port and still got the exact same problem. So at that point, I started wondering about the RAM. So I booted uh, into Memtest with a bootable, uh, you know, CD-ROM and lo and behold, as you can see here, this RAM started testing with errors in it and let it do lots of passes. It's just the first pass that you're looking at here, but uh, every pass it was throwing up uh, errors. So I've had a look through my uh, box of RAM and I've found these. These are some Corsair Twin X uh, 512 uh, megabyte sticks. Unfortunately, I've not got any more one gig sticks of DDR RAM, so we're just going to have to have these two 512 sticks and we'll have one gigabyte in total rather than two. Uh, these are a quite nice match pair. I think they're just cast latency 2.5 for AMD systems. So still got decent timings on them. Full DDR400 speed. Put these in. Run Memtest again. And as you can see, no errors at all uh, from Memtest on these. So tried the Windows XP install again. And this time the file copy process went absolutely fine. Uh, no problems whatsoever. So it seems that uh, that initial RAM that we were trying to build the system with, it's obviously uh, a bit dodgy. We've got some sort of problem there. Anyway, back to the uh, Windows XP installation. Maybe it's just because it's in sort of, you know, higher colour depth or higher resolution um, compared to the Windows 9X sort of graphical portions of the installs. But this almost looked so much more kind of, futuristic than those did. I mean, I guess they did compared to the sort of previous DOS and Windows, you know, 3 and 3.1 installs. But this, this was sort of the next leap up. I mean, I don't know what resolution and colour depth it is, but it probably wasn't that many years sort of back before this that that would have been the resolution and colour depth that most of us were running as desktops at. And this is just the install screen. So there we are, back at the familiar Windows XP desktop. Um, that all went okay with this replacement ramming, so um, looks like that old RAM or one stick of that old RAM was obviously a bit dodgy. So either way, whatever, I'll get some drivers installed on here and some software and then we'll dive in and have a look. Really creative? You're playing your sound on top of the Windows startup sound?
Okay, so we've got the drivers installed and I've got some software installed for us to have a look at, but th this hasn't been straightforward. Uh, let me explain. You saw there where we had the problems during the install. Um, so we took that initial RAM out, swapped those two Corsair sticks in, and then after that, the install went fine. It uh, booted to desktop for the first time, filmed that bit of video that you've just seen, and then I shut the computer down for the evening. That, that was all I could film that day. Then when I've come to pick the video back up a couple of days later, powered the computer on and it just would not boot up. Uh, just kept uh, crashing, you know, just, just freezing. Um, during the boot up process, or maybe even sometimes it might just get as far as loading the desktop or some of the desktop wallpaper. Never got any icons or anything like that, but yeah, just hung. And the point that it was hanging was just was random. It was different every time you rebooted it and tried again. So since I'd already changed the RAM once, I thought, let's just tr try changing the RAM again to be on the safe side. So went digging in my box of uh, sort of untested uh, RAM, got a couple of 512 meg sticks of DDR. And uh, now these are just some cheapo generic sort of no name brand type sticks um, that I've put in. They are matched in terms of times though, but as I say, not the same manufacturer or anything like that. Put them in and lo and behold, the computer's been absolutely fine ever since. It's not crashed once, you know, it's booted up every time. It's been absolutely rock solid. And yes, I know I'm tempting fate by saying that. So that's a little bit frustrating, really. I mean, here's our original RAM. I mean, I'm fairly sure that's dodgy, given that this was thrown us, um, you know, the errors when we ran Memtest on it as well. And uh, I did buy this as a sort of working, you know, fully working matched pair. So a little bit annoying on that one. But as for this Corsair memory, well, is this also bad? I mean, didn't throw up any errors on Memtest and it installed Windows XP fine, but it will not boot when these sticks are installed. So maybe they're bad too. Um, and I, I did try and get them working. Tried both sticks together. I tried one stick individually, the other stick individually. Tried um, relaxing the timings right off. Tried different memory sockets, cleaned up all the contacts, get it a bit more voltage. None of those things were working. But anyway, we've got our cheapo non-branded RAM in. It's working fine with that, so let's crack on. So first thing for me with any um, new operating system install, quick bit of housekeeping. First up, recycle bin. What are you doing down there? I mean, we've always had, or you know, we'd, by default back in uh, you know the Windows 9X series. Recycle bin was always up there, so quite what on earth it's uh, sort of doing down here. Uh, I got no idea. Um, but yeah, I don't know why. That just annoys me having it down there. So get him back up there where he belongs. And also in control panel here. I mean, this category view, did anybody actually keep this? I mean, it just means you have to use more clicks to get to the thing that you want to get to, to change. I mean, it's not like there's a million icons in control panel as it is. It's obviously what inspires the Windows 11 design team to put, you know, hide things behind layers and layers of clicks. Anyway, back to classic view. Again, that's that's just nicer for that. I don't know why, just I prefer it. But yeah, there we go. Other than that, I've closed the language bar down, down here again. Don't get me wrong, I can see the, the point of that if you're constantly switching between languages, but, uh, but I'm not, and it's just cluttering up my, uh, my taskbar, if not. Other than that, there's not really a lot I like to do with XP. I mean, it's got that kind of classic, uh, that XP look, uh, Lunar it was called, wasn't it? The kind of visual uh, theme, the kind of visual appearance of Windows XP. Uh, quite a change, I think, from the 9X style. I mean, I know some people probably like to go back to the kind of classic view and have that 9X slash 2000 type appearance. But I don't know, I really like this, the kind of big bold colours and the kind of shading on the edge of things, it kind of gives them that bit of depth. I think as, as UIs, they've kind of gone squarer and flatter in, in, in recent years and it's sort of single colour for things, etc. This, it's probably made me appreciate this kind of chunky, colourful Windows XP style. Uh, you know, it's probably made me appreciate this more. So speaking of styles, one of the programs that I've got on here for us to have a look at is Plus for Windows XP. 
Now I always installed Microsoft Plus right back from uh, Windows 95 and then again uh, the version for 98. Uh, obviously there wasn't one for ME but I got it again when we uh, got round to Windows XP. Um, and I don't know, it's a funny one for me this. It, it's um, As time's kind of gone on with Windows from 95 you know, to XP through the Plus versions, I've kind of sort of, I guess, cared for each one less and less. Oh, cared's perhaps the wrong word, but you, you, you know what I mean. Like the plus for 95, that was kind of, you know, you know it was sort of an essential add-on, I guess, for me. It was brought all these cool new features, which was like the icing on the cake, because if Windows 95 wasn't in many ways already, uh, you know, such a kind of big leap from uh, Windows 3.1. And then plus for 98, you're like, well, yeah, that's all right. That's not so bad. It was a little bit samey, perhaps. Recycle some of the uh, themes, if I remember. But uh, yeah, all right. That's pretty good. Still cool. And then by the time you got to plus for XP, and this is just the initial one, not that kind of second plus pack or that big roll up that they did. It was kind of a bit, eh, I don't know. I mean, take the themes, for example. I mean, for starters, there's just the four of them here. And... I don't know, I don't recall ever using any of these themes. They were just a little bit kind of, okay. I mean, coupled with the fact that I like that Windows XP background. It, it, it's, it's become, you know, a, it's become sort of an iconic picture. There's, have, you know, if you haven't seen them, have a look on YouTube. There's people documenting their journeys and going out to the spot where this picture was taken and, you know, recreating it. But even back then, before it was this iconic picture, I liked that. I don't know why, I just did. I didn't, I didn't really have the, uh, you know, have any inkling to change it, especially when this was always sort of, um, you know, all that the plus pack gave us to pick from. I mean, in terms of themes, the only one that I do remember using was the, um, the Zoom theme, you know, for the Microsoft uh, Portable Music Player. That was that kind of, was it orange and black sort of colour scheme or some orange and grey, something like that anyway. That was the only one I remember putting on. This lot never really bothered with them. Likewise, with these screensavers, I think there was a much kind of bigger jump and a, a lot more novelty when you got the sort of uh, the cool screensavers with Windows 95, whereas some of these, oh, sorry, with, with Plus 95, whereas some of these are just a bit, I mean, I don't know. Let's have a look at one. Space, let's uh, let's preview that. I mean, yeah, there's some dude floating around what's, I guess, supposed to be the International Space Station or something like that, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It's never really bothered. I think as well, perhaps something that contributed that was by the time we got to, uh, by the time we got to this sort of uh, point, a lot of us were using LCD screens rather than CRT, so you didn't have that, oh, but have a screensaver, I'll get burning type uh, type thing that, you know, we almost had drilled into you before then. I mean, like that, yeah, it's, it's all right, I suppose, but I don't know, didn't go out my way to, to put anything like that on. Uh, just a quick look at the digital media. Some of these things, they were okay, but I think by this point, a lot of these... Um, these sort of little add-on programs were starting to become redundant. I mean, you know, MP3 audio converters, there, you know, there were, there were lots of things that already did that and a lot of people would have already had one installed by them. A CD label maker, if you had a printer that printed, to, you know, to, for CD labels, it probably came with software that already let you do that. So, yeah, this is... Uh, this is perhaps not adding that value, if you like, that some of the earlier Plus stuff did. And even the games on here, I don't recall, like, whiling the hours away on any of these things. You know, you, while you've been sat waiting for your, you know, your friend on MSN to reply to your message or whatever it was you were doing. Um, I'd probably been far more likely to fire up, I don't know, Minesweeper or Space Cadet Pinball or something like that. The only one I think I perhaps did use a bit was uh, the Labyrinth one. This was the get the marble through the maze type game and don't fall down through the holes. I'll have a quick look at it. This was a kind of mouse control, if I remember, not keyboard. Just to sort of, you know, you move your mouse, tilt the table around. 
Ah, it's, yeah, yeah, it is mouse control. Oop. It is really sensitive at the default, um, you know, the sort of default mouse controls. Yeah, there we go. New record. Look at that, eh? So yeah, I think that one was a little bit of fun, but yeah, as I say, don't don't recall playing the others very much. So yeah, there we go. Microsoft Plus uh, for XP. Uh, cool to have, I guess, but not as big a deal as, as the earlier Plus uh, editions for me. And I think I mentioned there... MSN Messenger. I mean, you can see the little icon down there in the bottom uh, in the bottom right. Just having stuff like that around, it's one of those things that even though I'm probably not going to use it on here, and you can still use MSN Messenger for anybody who doesn't know. There's a third-party program called um, Escargo, I think it is, that takes uh, MSN and a couple of the other uh, instant messaging clients and lets you use them still uh, today. I'm, I'm not going to go into loads of detail explaining it. There's loads of other videos uh, on YouTube that um, show you how to get that set up and working if you're interested in doing so. Uh, but nonetheless, just having the little icon down there, um, I don't know, brings a smile to my face just because that's what I would have had. Just like, you know, I'd have probably have had ICQ or something like that sat down there on one of my Windows 95 or 98 installs. Yeah, it, it just looks right for me with something like that there. So let's have a quick look at some of the hardware um, or the software that's related to the hardware here. We'll start with this uh, Audigy 2. Now, I can't go into too much detail on this because there are seven, yeah, seven CDs that this thing comes with. I've only got some of the software off the first disk installed. So... Given there's all that software and there's all those cool um, ports and things to play about with that are on top of the uh, external box, which is just sat on top of the computer at the minute, um, I think this Audigy 2 and this kind of software package, that's probably worth a bit of a deeper dive on its own video. So for now, we'll just have a quick look around some of this stuff that we've got here. So we've got this getting started demo. Um, let's have a quick look. Um, what can we pick on the side? Um, oh, EAX Advanced HD for Games. Go on then, we'll have a look at that. Click here for a brief overview. Okay, I've got a little church or something there, is it? Okay, so it's there, for example, it's just showing us how you can blend what blends kind of one environmental audio sound into another. And uh, can we drag the little man about? No, it's just fixed. But yeah, I guess it's just a bit of a, a bit of a showcase of um, all the different uh, environmental audio things. Uh, yeah, anyway, that's enough for that one. Um, yeah, it'd be nice if you could drag the little guy around into all the little uh, audio effects. Make it a bit more interactive, like some of the uh, demos were for the Sound Blaster Live. Alright, let's just have a quick look at one more. Um, let's go for the next one, EAX Advanced HD for Music. Um, what should we go for? Smart Volume. Uh, let's go for Audio Effects. Click here to listen to an... That brings a smile to my face. Um, anybody who had the Sound Blaster Live cards and messed around with the demo from those, I'm sure that's the exact same uh, drum beat that was present. Yeah, that's the same drum beat that was present in those demos. Um, anyway, yeah, that's. Ah, make it stop. Right, yeah. That's either a nice nod back to the uh, sort of Sound Blaster Lives where the environmental audio stuff started, or Creative just haven't bothered recording a new audio clip. Either way, pretty cool to see. We'll delve into this more um, in, a, in, um, in another video. 
So here's our little external EO module. Now I had kind of envisaged this sort of stood on its side, you know, down the side of the PC, between the PC and the monitor. Um, that's kind of in my mind where I thought this thing uh, would go. But I've just sat it on top of the computer for now, and I've got to say, I, I really like it up there. Uh, for one, it's almost the sort of exact same width of the case, so, um, you know, that works quite well. The silver on the front and the top of the case, that's a pretty good match. You get this nice sort of um, red glow coming up, sort of lighting the underside of it from the cold cathode tube, so that looks kind of cool. Um, perhaps wouldn't be so cool if we have a load of stuff plugged into the front, but we'll, we'll see what we do there. Oh, and also, that little um, crack that's in the top panel, it covers that up too, so bonus. But yeah, um, we'll get into this a lot more when I do a full sort of video on the Order G2, but uh, for now, yeah, just like worth mentioning. And either way, I think it looks uh, spot on in keeping you know with the uh, with the looks of the whole machine so yeah glad i got that so what about graphics well uh, let's start with 3d mark 2001 we'll have a quick look at that which uh, should get a good score out of this considering this system's uh, you know a year or two after when uh, when this thing would have come out we go for 1024 by 768 32 bit color etc sort of default uh, system, uh, default settings I'll just let the benchmark run through and do its thing. So there we go, no surprises, 13,196 3D marks. So let's throw something a little bit more challenging at it. Uh, let's try 3D Mark 03. As before, same resolution, uh, same colour depth. We'll run the uh, default benchmark and see what we get. So there you go, 3D Mark 03, we get the kind of other end of the scale. We've got just 1,821 3D marks. Now, if we have a look at the details of that, you can see game one, frames per second's fine, the CPU test there, okay, sound test fine. But games two and three are really low frames per second, and game four you can't even run that one. And I think there's perhaps two possible explanations here about what could be what could be happening. First, it could just be that the driver version that I've got installed for the uh, for the graphics card is not really playing ball very nicely with 3D Mark. Perhaps some uh, more recent drivers, um, you know, relatively speaking, for the graphics card, but more recent ones anyway, would be um, would get as better 3D Mark scores. Or perhaps the second reason, and the one that I think is perhaps more likely, is that if I remember right, 3D Mark 03 was a DirectX 9 based benchmark and our graphics card is only DirectX 8 so there's perhaps some uh, uh, some routines or something you know within DirectX 9 that this thing's trying to call on that this graphics card really struggles with and it's perhaps that that's uh, bringing the uh, frame rate right down and causing these uh, this low well that seems low to me anyway but yeah this low uh, 3D Mark score but these, uh, these synthetic benchmarks are all well and good, but let's take a look at some actual games. So let's start off with uh, one of my all-time favourites, Unreal Tournament 2004, which, if I remember correctly, despite the name, was released towards the end of 2003. So I'd expect uh, our system here to be able to run it fine. I mean, recommended system requirements, 1.2 gig processor, 256 megs of RAM, etc. We're um, we're well in we're well in excess of all those, so yeah, shouldn't have uh, shouldn't have any problems running this really nicely. I always loved a bit of Instagive capture the flag. It was one of my all-time favourite game modes for UT. 
There's quite a lot of online servers supported this from what I remember. As in the, you know, we're running the game mode, obviously there are lots of servers that supported the game. But don't come this way, where are you going? In my defence, it's really hard trying to play this sat at a sort of oblique angle to the screen with the keyboard resting on your knee. Someone deal with that, will you? Oh dear me. So yeah, anyway, there we go. Um, as you can see, running a good sort of, what was that, 70, 80 frames per second on average, something like that. And just looking at those settings, high, very high type details, 1024 by 768, yeah. Runs this kind of game, absolutely perfect. Just, just the way I remember it. Spent uh, so many nights, you know, evenings, weekends, playing this game online, uh, you know, online servers. Good times, good times. Let's have a look at another one. Let's go for a bit of Doom 3. We got for 1024 by 768, which is what we've been uh, doing everything else at. And let's try medium quality first. Now, this, this wasn't a game that I spent that much time on. I remember playing it, and then I think like a lot of people, getting really frustrated with kind of just how dark it was, and just that kind of crazy idea that you couldn't hold a torch and a gun at the same time, or you couldn't duct tape one to the other, and yes, I know there was the mod for that, but uh, you shouldn't have to mod it. It should have been part of the damn game. But didn't they include it when they did the sort of game of the year edition of this, or did I imagine it? Either way, graphically, I think this was quite well optimized, wasn't it? So should uh, fingers crossed run okay? Welcome to Mars, where we have no budget for f lights anywhere. Okay, so yeah, this may only be medium settings, but this is running uh, absolutely fine. And yeah, th you know, th this game was a bit of a step up graphically and absolutely uh, no problems playing something like this. Oh, it's a third person cutscene. I forgot about these. Not quite Half-Life's introduction, is it? With the old uh, tram journey down to, you know, underground train journey down to work and then getting your suit on and the experiment. Um, having a few minor problems, shall we say. But yeah, I mean, it's, I know we've not really got into the sort of shooting, act, shooty action type bits, but yeah, it just didn't really grab me, this game. Just, Got a bit tiresome to be honest, but well, either way, again, as we'd expect, runs absolutely fine. And before anybody asks, can we run Crisis? No, no, we can't run Crisis. Um, we are not on the list of supported graphics chipsets. Uh, you know, when you look on the back of the box, it was newer chipsets than this that you needed. First person shooters, not your thing. Uh, what about a bit of Rise of Nations? Now this was one of the first uh, sort of RTS type games that I went to after uh, Command & Conquer Red Alert 2 I think. I tried Command & Conquer 3 and Red Alert 3 but I never really got into them the same day, uh, the same way that I did all the previous games in the, in the franchise, you know, right from the start to the end of the expansions for Red Alert 2. So let's just uh, do a quick learn to play since it's been a long time since I uh, since I played this. Let's have a barracks. 
There. And you, you help build that barracks. I'm probably going to get engrossed in this now and end up. Uh, so we're only early on in this uh, sort of tutorial level, but yeah, as you can see, their frames per second they're running constantly at uh, the sort of 59, 60 that this thing's capped at, and all right, there's not a whole lot happening, um, you know, in terms of the game, but the graphical settings they're all nice and high and. There's absolutely, uh, you know, no problems running these sorts of games on this system. And I'm probably going to end up playing the rest of this now, aren't I? Why is there no one on that farm? So just thinking of these games from the sort of time period that we're talking here, you know, that 2001, 2002, 2003. Um, just things like uh, Grand Theft Auto 3, uh, I think some of the Medal of Honor games, obviously the ones we've taken a look at here, Unreal Tournament, uh, etc. Um, what was it? Dungeon Siege, that was around that time, wasn't it? Um, Sims, uh, Vice City, um, I'm probably missing loads of the... Uh, popular you know really big popular games out from back then uh, uh command and conquer generals that would have been back then wouldn't it um planet side massively multiplayer online type thing um black and white you know all these sorts of games there's some classic games from that sort of time period that this system uh, would be absolutely perfect for running so there we are. I hope you've enjoyed this look at uh, our install of XP, uh, you know, getting over the problems that we got on the way and, uh, you know, a quick look at some of the software um, as well. Um, I do hope this last part of the video is coming across okay. Uh, I've had to change the app on my phone that I use to record these videos. Yeah, I've had to change it halfway through making this and I'm still getting, uh, you know, getting used to this new one. So fingers crossed that, you know, this, this is all uh, looks okay on the end of this video. Now this is not going to be the last time you see this Windows XP machine on the channel. There's some more little sort of odds and ends and extra bits that um, I think we need to cover on this. But uh, that's not going to be the next video. Um, given that this is part three, we've probably seen enough of this machine for now. But certainly, you know, in a few videos time, this will be uh, coming back. And there's a few more things that we've got to cover uh, on this. Uh, one or two more little surprises, hopefully, that'll, that'll make an interesting video. Now, I do want to say a big thank you to everybody that commented on the video about uh, the case. Uh, well, obviously not so much this case, but, you know, the case that we were trying to recreate. I had some really good suggestions, um, you know, about what uh, that original case was or, you know, the cases that it was based upon. So, as I say, big thank you to everybody who's left those comments. I need to uh, sort of go away and do... Uh, do a bit of research, a bit of digging uh, from those. Uh, see, if, see if what else I can uncover about that uh, original case. Likewise, um, again, thank you to everybody who's commented on part two with the hardware. It's really nice to read those comments about um, the sort of systems that everybody had back then and what hardware specs they were. And, it, you know, sometimes you come across stuff that, you know, um, you've, you've sort of forgotten about almost. And somebody mentions it in a comment, you know, I had this in this build, etc. And it sort of unlocks that memory that you've had, but you've just never really thought about it in, in a long time. And yeah, it's, uh, it's really enjoyable to read all them. So again, big thank you to everybody uh, that, that's, uh, that's left comments on those. So likewise with this one, I'd love to know uh, what software you were all running, uh, you know, on your early era sort of Windows XP machines. Uh, what were your favourite games that you all enjoyed playing? And uh, not just games, you know, what uh, what software, what applications, uh, you know, do you all remember using uh, on, you know, as I say, computers from this sort of era? So that's going to wrap it up for now. Um, I really hope you've enjoyed watching these videos. Um, if you have, drop us a thumbs up or a comment down below if you'd like. But for now, I'm just going to say thank you very much for watching. Um, I'm off to play some more Rise of Nations. And we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.